Welcome back to the Lost and Found podcast for episode 20. And this one is going to be split into two parts. Part one is going to be highlights of the first 10 episodes, the first 10 guests, some of the best bits for new listeners that may not have seen some of the first episodes. And some of the things that I really took away from these podcasts has just been amazing lessons or amazing clips that I really want to share. So that's going to be part one. Part two is going to be the same, but from episodes 11 to 19. So I hope you really enjoy these. In this episode, we've got Zach Blakeney, Justin Lovato, Amir Kaligi, Hamilton Souther, Chris Wilson, Renee Schrenker, Peter Sage, Barrett Pillman, Mark Gaffney, and Kevin Humphreys. So I hope you really enjoyed this. Before we get into it, if you haven't yet, please subscribe. It really helps the channel. And lastly, if you feel called to these types of conversations and you're seeking a tribe of people to have somewhat esoteric conversations about spirituality, consciousness, our feelings and emotions, how to process things, I invite you to join me on the Finding Freedom group call that I host every Thursday. If you're interested in that, just hit the link below and you can find where to register. All right, that's it from me. I hope you enjoy this. And let me know in the comments below, which was your favorite clip. Thanks again. See you on the inside. You hit the thing when it really releases some emotion. And, you know, I find that fascinating. And what you said about a lot of the, the pros and people that they can't see it. I wonder if there's something similar, you know, going on. And if, if that thing that seems very personal is actually very universal. Yeah. Yeah, I like to say that all the time, that what's most personal is most universal. I mean, that is the connection of consciousness. Uh, suffering feels the same for everyone. Uh, our stories are what elicit the response of that. But ultimately, what you're discussing is uh, discovering the cause, uh, the cause of the effect. Um, and that is really when we get into, you know, the type of work that I do with my clients, um, you know, we make a distinction between self-help and what we call transformation. So self-help is a $13 billion industry uh, that feeds off your need for more and more and more help. Um, there's not there's not value in self-help. This podcast uh, it can be a form of self-help. Uh, it's information. Uh, again, it's not that it's not valuable, but ultimately it doesn't work because it comes from a premise or a perception uh, that you're broken or that you don't have uh, answers uh, to the questions that you that you seek. And if you come from a perception that you're broken, then you're going to try and fix yourself. And all fixing does is reinforce that you're broken. And that is also a never ending thing. Why well, I'm broken, so I need to fix this. I'm broken, so I need to fix this. I'm broken. So it's, it's exhausting. It's tiring. And it's looking outside of yourself. Well, ultimately, these are all effects. Uh, Self-help is tools. And again, it's not that tools aren't valuable. Uh, but a hammer can't do anything without the, the causality of the human picking up the hammer and hammering the nail. So the tool does nothing. Uh, transformation comes from the place of what we say is that first we have to come from recognizing our wholeness. That we are whole and complete uh, in our state of being who we are. And that change is ultimately impossible uh, inside of yourself. Uh, because what you, again, try to change, you only reinforce that you're not whole. So coming from a perception of wholeness, you then start to see things a lot different. And transformation for us says that, look, until you discover the cause of your pain, and as long as you live in the world of effect, which you try and fix an effect with another effect, you're going to still experience the pain. So when we think about the ego, uh, the ego, what we call like the walls, uh, the walls are built around our perfection, so our wholeness. And the first wall is fear. So that then creates a belief. That belief then elicits a behavior. And then the ego then identifies with those beliefs and behaviors as being who you are. And this is a big victim loop. Because inside of that, we're not aware of choices. Uh, we just say, I believe this thing, so this is what I do. And a lot of coaches work with behaviors and beliefs. And, uh, and, and again, I've worked with plenty of guys and helped them hear, heal from porn addiction. And I tell them on the phone all the time, like, look, guys, um, you know, I can put a porn blocker app on your phone for 90 days and you won't watch porn. But that's not going to prevent you from watching porn in the future. There's a cause to the reason why you're doing the thing. So this is the principle of cause and effect. It's, it's a law of our universe that you cannot get around. So dealing with causes and doing the inner work to find the cause 
then is the choice point, which allows you to make a different choice for a different effect. But most people will not move through the resistance to understand what their cause is because they don't want to, because they don't want to admit that they're afraid. They don't want to admit they're afraid to be alone. They don't want to admit they're afraid that they're unworthy. They don't want to, be, they want to admit they're afraid that they're not um, capable. So once we do that, well, what do we do? We just prolong our feeling of being incapable and unworthy because we're not willing to face the cause. Yeah. That so was... consciousness really is this. It is it is going into the deepest level, the initiate point, so to speak, of whatever effects you're experiencing so you can transform that experience uh, for making a different choice. It's It makes you realize, no, no, it, there is something outside of me that I am connected to and my actions affect everything. Mm -hmm. They really do. And, and in fact, they create everything. Like, uh, I think on a really like quantum level, like I noticed if I do my work, if I, if I'm as mindful as I can be and I do my practices and I also be as present as I can be as aware as I can through, through my modalities, through my, my meditations, my breath, you know, acts of service, um, my reality is always shifting. I truly feel my oceans will get better. I, I see the world changing and becoming a utopia. If I can, if I can be that within myself, if I can honor it within myself, within my home, within my community and share that knowledge and, and, and really walk the walk. You know, I think there's a lot of us that conceptualize consciousness, but I think, truly being is the is like the full circle of it all we get so caught up into understanding it and philosophizing it i mean i was and still am into that and oftentimes and now i'm coming full circle it's like ah oh, it's just about being it's about yeah. being it's about being right here being love having your heart fully open being aware and it's it's beautiful it's that's what I, I, I've realized more than anything is like two choices when anything happens, does your heart stay open or does your heart close? And now I love moments where it, it wants to close. Cause I look at it. I'm like, no, we stay open. It's mm -hmm. like, no, stay open. And the only times I do close is if I'm not doing my work, if I'm not doing my meditations, if I'm not doing my breath, if I'm eating processed food, mm -hmm. if I'm taking in bullshit, my vibration drops, my consciousness drops. But if I consistently look under the veil, that is the universe through stillness, through the present moment, I keep upgrading this beautiful person to be more loving awareness. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really become enlightened, fully enlightened, till till about three years ago. When I, it was funny. It's like I went through this phase where I was. I was the first time ever I judged people, and it, you know that happens with spirituality. It's like when you become spiritual. You start seeing things, you start seeing how people aren't showing up. So then you end up judging the people that aren't doing the shit they're supposed mm -hmm. to do. It's kind of like a rite of passage, it seems, for all people who start getting into spirituality. And then, you know, then you the ego comes back because it starts judging all these these other people that are, you know, they're still on their mission and they're still on their path, rightfully so. And I remember there was like two years, and it was more specifically around around covid where i was just like i was in this space of judgment and i was really upset with people and the way they were acting and i was suffering more than i've ever suffered in my life yeah and I, it was like rotten in me it was horrible i was like what is this and then as i kept doing my meditations and found the breath um i i became I, I became aware that i was consciousness that i was the universe experiencing itself mm. through everything through everyone through different levels of awareness consciousness having a just an experience yeah through you through me through mm. trees rocks birds bees this space in between the blackness and outer space the sun everything in between it's just consciousness experiencing itself and and once i realized that I'm judging consciousness, essentially, I'm judging God, source, when... And yourself. And myself, yeah. yeah. And I'm, and right then, it was just like, it was gone. It was yeah. like, all of a sudden, all of it left. And I was like, 
damn i was like i was just it was it was immediately just lifted off me and and then i was like done with that done I, all i want to do is love people i just want to love them exactly where they're at and then you realize that's how you shift unconsciousness to consciousness it's by love mm. like if you judge we automatically go back to unconsciousness because yeah. loving awareness doesn't judge it's loving awareness and so i realized if i really want to help the unconscious who are causing suffering I should lead by loving example and I should love them fully as they are without judgment, without frustration, without any of those things. What you speak of, of going within, I find now I've really built a strong relationship with this inner guidance system where I will actually ask a question out loud and I'll just sit in the stillness, not in thought. And I feel, I feel things arise within me that, just feel so clear and to be the right thing for me versus mm -hmm. previously I'd always be looking for this person to tell me this or this person to tell me that. And, and before I was looking for answers, I was just kind of following the, the things that the, the trappings that I think mm -hmm. we can so easily fall into that most of society, I feel like mm -hmm. have fell into and the whole time when I was in that space of, of trying to chase or looking outward for those dangling lights, it's like somewhere in me, there was a whisper which just knew it wasn't right. But you assume it kind of is right because everybody else is doing it. So that mm -hmm. must be the path. That must be the path to, you know, where I want to get, which is to feel like I'm worthy or that I'm meant to be mm -hmm. here. What? What do you think has got us to this point to be so misguided and so far from the mark? Mm -hmm. Well, anytime somebody tells you that you need them or their system to reach a state of spiritual evolution, then you're being taken. Then a part of you is being taken or used. Um, and look, there a, a lot of good has come... Uh, some some good has come from religion. Well, let's say a lot of good has come from religion and a lot of pain and destruction and death uh, and uh, disconnecting uh, men and women from their innate natural connection to the natural world has come from, uh, from religion. So, and it's not just religion. We can talk about corporations and we can talk about any large entity that wants to numb you down um, in order to uh, hijack your attention for its own self gain, and really, what's happening is you are abdicating your attention that should be residing deep within the roots of your body. Mm. And uh, we, you know, we as a society uh, have kind of lost touch with these lower chakras, these lower parts of our bodies that are earth. Uh, earthbound we are you know because of uh, the uh, technology and, and um and, uh, we'll call it technological advancements in the society that we live in our attention and energy rises up to here so a lot of people live in their minds so uh, a lot of the work that, that i do with men is is reconnecting them with these lower chakras reconnecting them with the natural world reconnecting them with what it feels like to rub their fucking hands in the dirt and put their hand, feet in the mud and to breathe in, um, you know, the, the rain and to become more familiar with reawakening their senses um, to a more natural state. Um, because I, I, I truly believe there's divinity in the expression of life manifest, whether that is through the flowers that we get to see or the, or the, or the trees that bear fruit or, um, uh, you know, the, the radiance of life that, that runs through all of us, there is a intrinsic connection to that power. Mm. And when you stop relating or tuning into that power, um, you give yourself permission to actually become more abusive in your search for fulfillment. That's why you see so many 
you know, you know, men giving themselves permission to take advantage of, you know, feminine counterparts or female partners. There's a disconnect from your, from a deep sense of self that gives one permission to act in such a way. Because if you were really tuned into that, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to do ill to, to a, an extension of you, <laughs> you know, it would be insane. Um, so I, I really think it has to do with a, a, a re, re tethering back to um, our, uh, the earth, <laughs> the natural world, uh, learning how to relate and move with it. And, and don't get me wrong, the natural world, you know, is what it is. It is an intense, beautiful, powerful, vicious, creative, destructive uh, mechanism of life, death, and regeneration. It includes predators and prey. And yeah, yeah, like, but uh, I got news for every, you know, everybody that we're all going to go through that process, no matter how much money you got, no matter how much you chase your, you know, your, your, your lights and, and flashy, you know, um, uh, signs at the end of the day, we go through that process. We go through that, that death, re, uh, destruction, rebirth process. And we go through that as humans throughout our lives and stages of life that we die to and are born again to, but we also will eventually physically, uh, come to a conclusion of this version before uh, our consciousness manifests in some other form. When faced with existence, I feel like that's something I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas, or not ideas, your experience, what you've experienced when it comes to existence and you know that gateway, that door that you spoke of for people that might be called to the door but maybe haven't ventured all the way through to see what's on the other side. I'd, I'd love to really kind of hear your ideas and takes on that relating to existence. Yeah. I think beyond, uh, you know, what we think of as like the material world, there's this energetic world that's going on and we use a, it's a really interesting uh, fixation on light to prove this idea of differentiation and separation. And so, you know, we, we use our, our eyes to fixate on things. We forget that the image that we're seeing is actually an image inside our mind. It's our mind taking the light and making sense of it. And so it, you know, it makes walls, walls, and it makes the door, the door and makes cities, mazes, and it makes uh, a computer screen look like an image, et cetera. And we forget that what's happening is that light stimulating the eye. It's going through the optic nerve. It's going into the brain and the brain is using its neural network to be able to create this understanding of space time. And pretty soon over time, the way that we we do that collectively is to make that reality. And only the things happening within that field or spectrum is being real is, is you know, what we experience until the point that, uh, you know, we're just ourselves. We live in a an idea of our identity. In that identity, we go through our daily life and it's pretty repetitive. And what sits behind that is ultimate existence. Existence was there before you uh, we're born existence is there after you die existence is is the origin of your consciousness which is not just located or relegated to your physical body it's part of your body while you're alive but it's it's more expansive than that it goes beyond that fixation of light that we live in where you know we think that everything has to fit within the four walls of our existence in that box that we've created for ourselves and the doorway really takes you through that box it, it takes you through an experience to, uh, you know, where you, you can see infinity goes forever. The universe goes forever. You start to see that, you know, out in the rest of the cosmos is an unbelievable amount of spiral galaxies and stars, literally billions upon billions upon billions of them. And this idea of being isolated here of the earth and this human dramatic story starts to fall away and consciousness becomes more of a phenomena uh, of spirit, of God, of source. And uh, I like source as a term just simply because God is also a religious term. And source is about the essence of even how religious people came to the notion of a God. So it's like, it's, it's you know, seminal to the idea of, uh, of there even being religion. And so I just think that, you know, 
this idea of existence asks the question and answers the question for the universe itself. So it's, it is also what scientists call big bang or origin of this version of universe. It's also the origin of people believe in multiverse. It's also the, the understanding that beyond death, there's something so much more than both the idea of something dying, the idea of something reincarnating or some binary scenario that you get presented with like heaven or hell or, you know, these other concepts. So it goes beyond the notion of nothing. It goes beyond the idea of a binary reality. And it goes beyond the idea of a cyclical reality where you have to come back and do this again in some other form. All of those philosophies, I think, are very powerful philosophies and billions of people believe in them. But ultimately, existence proves that there are gateways into and out of all of those different uh, scenarios. So if you look at the philosophies that sit behind them, there's always some way to reincarnate and ultimately achieve the way out of reincarnation. There's always a way to ultimately find salvation and move from you know one one side of the binary argument to another and i think those are arguments that we're creating about this phenomena of existence and uh, existence is just something that's so powerful because we don't have a, a clear understanding of even why we originated in the first place other than the fact that we were part of a great plan of source and that it's still unfolding and here's what i believe i believe if people can do this work where they do go deep deep in and they'll not know oh my god like i i didn't realize i'd separated this away i didn't realize it wasn't okay for me to laugh i've actually suppressed laughter or i've suppressed joy i've suppressed love i've suppressed you know like so many of the positive things that we kind of want to experience that we've at some point thought no i can't let that out or that you think you need to get from something outside, right? Like, oh, I needed this. I needed a relationship to do this for me. Or I needed um, even this group of this men's group, right? Or yeah. this job, but I didn't. I can discover it on my pillow alone, yeah. right? Yeah. In my bedroom by learning to come into the body. And then that, and then realizing along the way that I can't, I can try to do it hard. Right. Like I could try to meditate properly. I could be like, mm, real tough. Like, mm, I'm going to really force myself through this meditation. And now I'm blocking myself off from it. I'm actually yeah. relaxing. Yeah. Right. And, it, and it's a process of relaxing and, and coming in and, and, and really caring. And I love what you said about coming into the lower three chakras. Right. Um, have you heard of the practice of pure awareness by Reggie? with Reggie Ray practiced with Shogun Trungpa. So. The practice of pure awareness is, um, is all around discovering how to come into the seat, how to find your seat. Uh, the 17 steps of seated practice of just finding a cushion, like you find your seat and you appreciate your seat because you're going to sit still for a while. If you don't appreciate your seat before you sit, it might be crooked. It might not be stable to sit and to make the journey. So you find your seat and then you come into your body and there's all different ways to come into your body. And as you come into the body, you realize that you can actually be out of the body, right? And then you breathe down into the lower belly, into the hara, into the dantian, into the root chakra, into that area of the nervous system that we the two major spots of the nervous system that we can we can bring a lot of tension to to bring elasticity you breathe down into the lower belly and then as you breathe into the lower belly you breathe down into the earth and the reason you breathe into the earth is to realize that the space inside of me is not separate from the space outside of me mm. and that i am actually connected to the environment Right. And that step down regulates the nervous system and opens our, our somatic experience to everything. Right. I now feel into the environment and our culture, my culture has told me that somehow I'm separate from you. Like, right. And then now after you practice breathing into the earth and it's a direct experience, it's not a thought, it's not a concept or an idea. You can't think your way to this. You have to actually practice. And as you practice, you share your practice with another human being and you relate, what is it like for me, right? And for me, one of the things that came up for me in practice is um, 
I had a hard time allowing myself to breathe into the earth because I live on the second floor of a building. Hmm. <laughs> right? Like how funny is that? Right? Like, right? Yeah. Like I had this idea that I had to go sit outside in the woods. And so my practice would be like messed up all the time because I it take me 15 minutes to walk to the woods and sometimes it's raining, but being in a group of men and sharing in that, sharing how my practice was really helped me work through a, 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 like permission to allow myself to just breathe down into the earth from the second floor of my building, right? It's a concept. It's a total facade of the mind, right? And, and then you breathe up from the earth into the lower belly and the final, and the fifth step is to notice the, the, the central channel and you unfold and you you notice the upward flow of the quality of the somatic of the energy coming from the root up behind the heart up behind the chest and you unfold the body and the body wants to take this position and the more you get to know it the more caring and compassionate and soft you are the more sensitive you become the more you can feel what you were talking about before right and that's what i why i went through this whole explanation of my practice is to share how my practice on its own is similar to yours right like you you know you know that there's something very special to experience in the belly like there's and in the practice it's called something to experience and the reason it's called something to experience is because if we give it a name it becomes that like we can't, I can't call it love. I can't call it joy. I can't call it because sometimes it's scary as fuck. Like it really scares me about is my life going to change, right? Like I don't want parts of my life to change. And, and that has been scary at times in my practice, right? But then I come back and you have a community of men in your life who you can actually have this depth of, I could, this conversation, this, what I'm sharing right now, 15 years ago, I could not even conceptualize having a conversation like that about my practice with another man, let alone 10 men. And like you say, with spirituality, to begin with, it might be, you feel a calling that, you know, thinking that I need to be in the best shape and date the, the traditionally most attractive women and make as much yeah. money as possible and have the belongings that are a signal and status that I am good enough. So we think, oh, okay, hang on. That's, that's not right. That doesn't feel right. I feel a calling to be more aligned. So we start doing the meditation. Mm -hmm. We start feeling, oh, okay. Yeah. This feels more, more like it. We start doing the breath work. Oh God. Wow. I'm feeling things shift. I'm starting to release some traumas. My nervous system feels better regulated, yeah. but then we start to use that as a, Hey, Look how long I can meditate. One hour, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and I've been there. Like, it's... I mean, it's it's fascinating for me because I, I, and, you know, sometimes I even catch myself where, where, where I'm just there and then I'm like, oh, shit, no, 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 I need to meditate. I need to meditate. Otherwise, or I need to breathe. Otherwise, or I need to do this certain practice or that certain practice or be like that otherwise and that brings up that like catching myself having the awareness to catch myself in those moments it allows me to inquire deeper and go more inward of like why why and i remember an, an incident mm -hmm. i remember that sitting on the beach right and i had so much anger inside of me i don't know what happened but i was so fucking angry and i was sitting at the beach and i, I was sitting there and i was like okay let's breathe and I was like, okay, Renee, one, one moment. Wait, wait, wait. Back up, brother. Why do you want to breathe right now? Because I don't want to feel the fucking anger. So I'm not breathing to actually allow the anger to be there and allow that part of me to be seen. No, I'm, I'm, I'm using mm. something to push it aside, to suppress it, to hide it in a, in, in a, or to hide it in a room where I don't want to confront it because it doesn't match with the image I have around spirituality of, I should not be angry. I should just accept, I should just accept everything. But it's a funny thing, right? Because the acceptance mm -hmm. now doesn't lie in ignoring something. It's, it's, in, it's within 
accepting and welcoming the anger or the overwhelm, the sadness, the joy, the hap whatever is there, you know? And I think this is where it gets more nuanced, man, because it's, and I think this is the thing with spirituality. To me, it feels as though one of the biggest barriers to, and I'm using the term spirituality. We could say higher consciousness. We could see, we could say, you know, just seeing things in a way that they work beyond the obvious, but it's the ability to hold the paradox. And it's the ability to realize that. So our very kind of understanding of paradox and things being a, a contradiction, I think can be the block because so frequently the opposite things are both true. And that's where we get to non-duality and we realize it's actually the same thing. Yeah. You know, hot and cold. At what point does hot become cold? 100%. You know what I always love to, you know, the example I love to give, it's like a coin. You can look at each side of the coin individually. And on one side you focus on, you can see a head on the other side, you can see a number and you can see it as two different objects. But then when you really zoom out, and I think this is where spirituality m comes for me more into place of you zooming out of the narrative. What I shared before at the beach, I'm, I'm zooming too much in, I'm losing myself in the details. But when I'm zooming out, I'm catching myself realizing that it's just two sides of the same coin. And that's, I think, also where then the acceptance yeah. arises more of like detaching from the attachment towards the number or the face. And I mean, what we were talking about before is that yeah. the number was the typical lifestyle of having money, women and cars. And the face was just like being still and meditating the whole day and doing whatever. But then to just actually zoom out and, and see that it's nothing wrong or, or there's nothing wrong or right with e either one of them. And then to just, ah, I mean, that gives you this, ah, you know what? Okay, cool. Yeah. And if you want to go a level deeper, if you want to go a level deeper, we can be paying so much attention to either side of the coin. And then we go, oh, no. I'm not either side of the coin. I'm the whole coin. But then we go, wait a minute. I'm not the coin. I'm the person holding the coin. <laughs> that is that is the thing. You and know what I mean? We but can that's really... what I meant by zooming out, you know? You really zoom out. But this is the funny yeah. thing because we are so – we always look and then we identify with the things we see. But then when we zoom out, that's mm. when we that's when we start realizing that – Everything is perfectly imperfect when we, when, we, when we allow ourselves to grasp our wholeness through which our holiness shines through to then recognize that the sadness and the joy comes, comes together. And I think that's, that's a beautiful piece to recognize on your path or in life when you start recognizing, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. And when you start welcoming all those parts, all of them, and then you start embracing them. Because that's when we start to literally be ourselves. So for example, to a certain paradigm, surrender means something completely different to a different paradigm, a higher level of consciousness. The same way that love can mean something very different to a either lower level of paradigm or, or consciousness compared to a higher one. It almost has a completely different meaning. And it seems as though the word itself actually goes through an evolution as we move through an evolution of paradigms. And, um, you know, when you said about surrendering the need for control, what kind of came up for me then is that I think when we surrender the need for control, we're actually aligning with more of a truth within the universe, which is we don't really have that much control. So I think when we let go of the need for that, I think that's to me, it almost feels like that's part of the power of the surrender because actually we're aligning with a much greater kind of law 
that is around us all the time, whether we know it or we don't. And I think part of that surrender is aligning with that, realizing I can't control so many things. So when we do surrender that need, we're actually aligning with something much greater. Well, love that. And and if you'll permit me, let me add a, a little clarification that may also help you know, people listen. Please. Uh, and that is that, yeah, you know, what we're actually surrendering is the ego's need for control. Yeah. The paradox is when we give up the need for control, we actually get more of it because we realize we're actually co-creating rather than trying to manipulate matter. So when you say, oh, I can't control everything, you can control your relationship to the river. And to be fair, in the words of yeah, the, uh, the great poet Rumi, you know, we are not a drop in the ocean with the entire ocean in a drop. You know, we are individuated units of consciousness that essentially pattern down from the larger consciousness whole. Yeah. And so when we're surrendering, we're surrendering the illusion of separateness, which then gives us more control to align with what it is we could always have more control over, but not when we're trying to take it. When I used to teach martial arts, I've not actually, I kind of stopped coaching uh, in the lockdowns, but you know, with BJJ, one of the things I would say is sometimes people will be so hell bent on let, trying to get an arm bar and, and they're just trying to fight for it, fight for it. And the entire time they're missing the fact that the person's neck is wide open for a choke. Yeah. And, and I think that is kind of what we see. Like you said, you can focus on the river and the way you're going. And I think BJJ actually really uh, is, is a good example of that. If you can be so hell bent on needing that one thing and it's like, Hey, there's so many other things here that are wide open that you're not even seeing because you're so laser focused on this one thing that you think has to be the thing that you get. And in, in that analogy, the universe is the coach screaming from the corner. Yeah. But we can't hear the coach if we're too focused on the outer world. Yeah. Which is, yeah, yeah the, the, the rolling on the mat. So if we can take time out to learn how to connect, as I say, outer world follows inner world, not the other way around. You know, we have access to guidance. We have access, you know, I say all the answers are in alpha. And when your brain is operating at anywhere between eight to 12 cycles per second, you know, where your inner world becomes more real and more part of your focus than your outer world, then you have access to answers that transcend what the front part of your brain has access to, which operates in beta, anything above 12 hertz. For most people, high beta, which is 15, 16, where they live. Your, your operating system doesn't have access to the, you know, the information that you, know, you can give you the answers. So you look at, uh, for example, a you know, what we call memory or short-term memory or you know, recollections of events. Your, your frontal lobe is amazing at being able to make a new house out of existing bricks. It can rationalize, it can justify, it can you know, do logical equations and, and basically comparison frames and what have you, and it can weigh up. It can do its own SWOT analysis with the data on the spreadsheet. But true new information, insight that comes from beyond your ability to figure it out or piece together stuff uh, on what you're doing or come up with your own internal ideas, all of the answers that most people seek can be found external to that repository accessed in alpha. That is the coach screaming at you from the sidelines saying, uh, guess what? The next wide open. And when we're so focused on our own agenda or stressed because we're trying to force an outcome in the outer world, we cut off from all of the coaching that would really be showing us a more effective, efficient way that we can't see with our you know, myopic you know, lack of blind spots. I find if I slip into the thought process of just kind of separate self, human, just having my own individual experience, you can slip into the narrative of surely this is meant to be my life partner that I'm meant to craft a life with. And it's not mm. meant to just be a year long thing. 
But I feel like some of the friction that comes up around that is that I think I know better than, than the divine and the great plan. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going, well, surely this means that. And no, maybe that level of connection was meant to have facilitated this growth, this emergence of you as your unique self, of her as her unique self, because that has all happened since we met. Mm. Crazy levels of evolution, awareness, emergence of our kind of unique self, so much processing, so many wonderful times and a roller coaster. And, and maybe that was what it was meant to be. Mm. And I think when we hang on to the idea with a death grip that it's meant to be this thing because I watched all the movies and when you meet your soulmate, it's forever. <laughs> and no, maybe it was the perfect thing that was beautifully crafted at this amount of time for you to become the person that you were struggling to be and they just highlighted all the things that you'd been avoiding. Mm, absolutely. Uh, last year I had that person come into my life. His name was Nick. And as soon as we started hanging out, I was like, oh my God, this is my person. How could it not mm. be? I, I made me reflect on all my relationships past and go, well, of course they didn't work out. They weren't Nick. Oh my God. And he was the first conscious person I ever dated, albeit one of our big hiccups was that he's sober and I'm very much in plant medicines. And he came into my life right at the time when I really came out about, this is it. This is my passion. I'm, I'm working with psychedelics now. I'm facilitating psychedelics and I am in that space healing and helping others heal and uh, became you know, it went from being maybe like 20% of my life to like, now it's my full fuck. Yes. It's uh, 60, 70% of what I do. And, but Nick, Nick came along and he gave me the space to fully sit in my authenticity. And when I would be melting down about, I didn't hear from you for two days and you must not like me and him to be like, everything's okay. And he's like, even the fact that you're melting down about it right now is okay. And I was like, literally no one has ever said that to me before, that my meltdown is okay. And and he would hold this beautiful space. And gosh, he helped heal my womb so much. The respect he had for my body sexually, I had never experienced before. Um, he turned me on to my breathwork facilitation that I did. He he was the first man who ever came into my life and just made everything better. And I was like, how could this not be my partner? And very quickly he was like, I'm not it. I'm not him. I, I, I desire something different. He also wants kids and I don't want kids. Um, so another big thing. And, um, but then even as we decided not to date anymore, we, and I cried and I cried and he held me and he just, Man, he really showed up in that divine masculine giving and, and made me see what it would be like to have just a divine partner. And I had never known a relationship could be like that. And so I, I reflect back on him. And even as we were going separate ways, I, the next day I wrote him this like two page long, grateful note of everything he did that I was grateful for. And I'd never broken up with someone in that way. I'd never written someone a gratitude letter afterwards. And I still see his place in my life as, as opening the doors to opening my eyes of, of what was possible. And I didn't know he was possible. And now that I did, I could never settle for anything less. And that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And, but in the time though, at the time of it, you know, coming to the end of that chapter, how did it feel? Oh, it was, especially when he was like, you know, I didn't think we were in a relationship, but the way we've been acting, it, it's, let's admit, we've fallen into a relationship and this isn't what I want. And that was yeah. felt so rejected of how could you not want this, but also yeah. identifying like, you know, for me, that's a huge thing of you want kids and I don't. And I'm not here to try to convince you otherwise. Like that's a very personal 
decision. Yeah. And I don't normally date someone who wants kids. And when we had discussed it in the first couple of days of hanging out, I was like, I don't date someone who wants kids. And he's like, well, maybe you should examine what it's like if you do. And I was like, well, there's a definitive end date. And I don't. And so I thought he was reexamining wanting kids by being with me. And he thought that I was just allowing for the idea that there would be an end date and that didn't feel great. And so, um, yeah, in the breakup, I just realized that I had nothing but respect for him, even mm -hmm. though it wasn't what I wanted. Um, I had so much respect for the, the doors that he opened in my life and connecting me to this community that I had only been in for a year. And he was very connected to the spiritual community here in this town. And that was so beautiful. And he and I st have stayed good friends to the point where now, um, you know, he's, he's been in my living room crying about dating <laughs> and the people that he's trying to see. And he's met my, my partner now. And, um, just it's to watch them hug even was so beautiful because Nick opened the doorway for my pos my partner to be possible. And I just, I have so much respect for in the zoom out of my story, the role that he played in, in me seeing, okay, now the partner's coming because I'm starting to really attract something better and something more beautiful. There's something that stood out to me that I thought was really interesting, which is we aren't basically, we aren't static. We are evolving. I am not Sabri and you're not Mark. I'm Sabriing and you are Markling. And I thought that was, that was really interesting, a really interesting idea that we aren't just static and something else that that you'd mentioned as well that i heard that stood out was that love evolves through generations and what came up for me is that it not just love it seems as though throughout the sabring and the marking as we go through our lives and we are evolving throughout our lifetime it seems as though words actually evolve throughout the evolution as well. So for example, you know, like the map of consciousness, um, Hawkins, is it, is it David Hawkins? Um, Power versus force, the book. And There's a bunch of maps, that's, that is one, that's a different conversation, but yes. D desire is considered to be one of the kind of, like, like a, l a lower paradigm level of consciousness. But then when I heard you speak about the idea that like desire like, is evolution. Yeah. Well, evolution is desire. Maybe both are true. But it made me realize that, ah, literally within these, we could say paradigms, words take on a, a new a new meaning and almost like a, a new life. So for example, love, potentially in, in separate self, is, and a lot of people's model for love is it's, it's transactional. I give it to you, you give it to me, we're both doing it, we're both happy. Okay, we love each other. But if you stop giving it to me, well, I'm I'm stopping mine. And then we go to maybe maybe true self. Maybe the idea would be that no, I, like love is a state of being, and that I am love, and that how can I like how can I need you to love me or me to love you because I am love. But then maybe a unique self, we say, and this really stood out for me as well, is that love is a perception. Yeah, and it's good. my ability to see you and not just see you but to accept you and honor you and cherish you in your entirety in your uniqueness beautiful 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 so first up you're you're tracking well and beautifully and thank you and and you made a whole bunch of really important points there so let's see if we can take one at a time okay let's start, start with one and you really let's split this into three so the first thing is this realization that I'm not a noun, I'm a verb, right? And so the process of transformation and the process of becoming fully alive and empowered in my life as a unique self, playing my instrument in the unique self symphony is requires that I denominalize, right? I denoun, right? The, the denominalization of self, I've got to step out of being a noun, right? This kind of static thing, and I've got to become a verb. Right? So I'm verbing, right? Right. I'm sobbing, right? I'm, I'm marking. Now, gorgeously, in the original Hebrew, the word for noun or thing 
and the word for word is the same. So a thing, a davar, is also the word. And the point is, there is no such thing as a thing, right? A thing is a dynamic, transforming, right? Evolving, right? Ever becoming process, right? Reality is this unfolding, gorgeous play, right? This gorgeous movement towards ever higher, deeper, wider expressions of intimacy, of goodness, right? Of truth, right? Of beauty, right? Of value. And I am a unique discretion of reality. I'm a unique configuration of Eros. And I'm always moving towards value, beauty, goodness, truth. And so if I ask someone, tell me what your life's going to look like in 10 years from now. And they think they can answer that question. They're dead. Right? But if you think, right, you're a noun. If you think basically the way it's moving is it's a billiard ball, it's a mechanical world. I do this and this will happen and this will happen. No, no, no. There's a force of eros, which is filled with surprise and contingency and delight and right and emergence, right? And radical newness that's moving through you and you're open. And the word open in Hebrew, the word open means evolution. Evolution, you evolve when you're open, right? Trauma, the demons, Right, the right, what the demons do when the demons enter us, when, when we're lost in kind of self-loathing, right? It, it's it, it's our incapacity to open to new possibility. Right, I actually believe that yesterday defines me. Right, yesterday becomes my slave driver. The greatest slave driver is the experience that yesterday defines today. The greatest liberation is the realization that tomorrow liberates me from all yesterdays right into a new possibility now it doesn't mean that there's not karma uh, just stay close to me there's karma of course there's karma so whitehead the great philosopher who wrote principle of mathematical with george Bertrand russell in cambridge not far from you right whitehead talks about every moment being an occasion and that occasion receives all of the past but that's all of my yesterdays but that occasion also has an irreducible dimension of newness, of emergence, of possibility that didn't exist in any previous moment. So actually, gorgeously, the original word in Hebrew for time is zman, Z-E-M-A-N, and zman, time means invitation. So there's an invitation in this moment, and right, in this conversation that I get to have, right, with Saab, my little brother, right, there's an invitation not to repeat yesterday, but something in the space in between us and in the space between us and this moment, which is irreducibly new, it's not a repetition. It's, it's different than any moment to come and any moment that's passed, right? It's pregnant, right? With a new birth, right? So we want to enter this moment. We want to feel this moment. What does it have to, what's it whispering in our ear? What's it inviting us to? Now, the second I close to this moment, I'm closed to the possibility of this moment. Then all I have is the past. Right? In other words, if I'm not actually in right, this creative advance of radical newness, of novelty, right, that actually lives and inheres, as Whitehead says in this moment, or the Hebrew masters say, the zman, the, the irreducible invitation of this moment, then all I have is all of the karma of previous moments pouring into me, <clears throat> which is all of my attachment breaks and all of my sins, whatever that means to me, and all of my violations, and all of my sense of smallness and all of my sense of, 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 of trauma. And then those demons overtake me, right? I liberate myself from demons and everyone has demons, right? I move from my demons by moving to my daemon. It's from demon to daemon and daemon is the call of my future. And, you know, if, if you put a, a 357 Magnum to my head, which I would appreciate you not doing, but if you did, right, you did, you know, and, and you said to me, right, you know, make my day, right? Tell me a definition of God that actually makes some sort of sense. Well, I'd say you can't define God. And then you kind of cock the lever. Say, don't give me, you can't define God. Give me something. Okay. So I would say God is the possibility of possibility. Right? God is the possibility of possibility, right? It's the inherent, infinite possibility that loves you madly, right? So in other words, cosmos is not just structure and mechanics. 
cosmos is radically personal, but, but God's not like a small personal God. It's not God is ultimate personhood. Right? There's an infinite personhood of divinity. That's why the name of God that I, I, I use and we, 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 you know, she whispered it in our ear some time ago is we call God the infinite intimate. Mm. God's infinite, right? The infinity of divine power. And, and yet this divinity, this infinite divinity that manifests, right? Billions and billions of light years and dazzling complexity and, and unimaginable, you know, chemical structures and atomic superimpositions, right? You know, you know, an unimaginable field, right? Of, of matter, right? And, and atom and molecular structure, and then, you know, cellular structures, and then organic and organismic structures and, 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 and you know, cosmic, you know, universes and, and galaxies and, you know, billions and a hundred billion galaxies, right? And, you know, all of that, all of that, all of that, which is kind of divinity in third person, all of that lives in me in, in first person, and then turns to me in second person and says, sub man, I'm madly in love with you. It's like, wow. Right? It's like, right, the entire energetic, infinitely unimaginably dazzlingly beyond brilliant all supercomputers exponentialized can't even begin to touch it all of that sitting in a chair looking at Saab and saying man I love that dude in a way that I love no one else right? it's, it's a unique quality there's a quality that lives between Saab and the infinite intimate that doesn't live between Mark and the infinite intimate which means, and I stay close, it gets, it gets so wild when you get the realization of the interior sciences, it means that God, as it were, the infinite intimate, experiences a shocking self-recognition through sob that he, she, it can't experience through Mark. Because that's what a good friend does. You find a dimension. The reason you love your good friend is because you love them. You Love is a perception. I see them. Yeah. And then in that perception, it actually evokes a new dimension of me. So you're, with your closest friend, when you're hanging with a particular close friend, there's a dimension of sob that gets to appear because they evoke that dimension, right? Yeah. So that's, that's my relationship to the infinite intimate, to the divine. There's a dimension of divinity that's actually made manifest, that's actually able to appear in relation with sob, with the unique quality of intimacy that is sobness, that can't appear in relationship to Buddha or Lao Tzu, right? Or Moses or Confucius or Jesus, only in relationship to Saab. And to the precise extent that Saab doesn't clarify his trauma, doesn't turn his fate into destiny, he loses the capacity to generate that shocking self-recognition in the infinite intimate, and the worlds are weakened. And kindness loses something of its hold in the world. Right? And the, the energy of allurement of goodness and truth and beauty isn't quite what it needs to be. And that has an effect and then it ripples and it cascades and it undermines. But to the mm. precise extent that Saab then re-steps into his fullness, because we all fall out of our fullness. That's part of the structure of reality. And then Saab steps back in and he, he finds himself and he, and he feels his tears close to the surface and they're tears of ecstasy and tears of transformation and tears of longing. Right? And he finds himself and, and then he begins to ripple. And then this, this, what's called in the lineage, this power, this eros pours into cosmos and Saab becomes the stunning reflection in which Saab's dear friend, the infinite intimate, finds herself in a way that she never could before. Mm. And in that sense, Saab quite literally causes there to be more God in the world. More God to come. Wow. Wow. Right? It's like... I would say that if you'd asked me a year ago, a lot of the things to do with shamanism, even though I've you know, I've, I've done plant medicines and you know, ayahuasca for seven years. I, I kind of dismissed it a little bit and and didn't really kind of, I was a bit like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Until mm -hmm. I actually started to experience some of these things myself where I was like, okay, <laughs> don't know how to explain this. And, and now I find myself at a point where it's a subject that I don't know 
too much about in depth, but I've I've felt and experienced it, and now I'm completely sold. I'm all the way in, and I'm actually really looking forward to talking to you about your journey uh, and shamanism and and how you got here. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it, once when you do plant medicines, that's probably the closest you're getting to the the sort of the state of a shaman gets in where they stand between the worlds. So in, mm. in Jarmanism, we, we, we have the three realities and, and then our physical reality. And uh, I often think of the shaman as the, it's almost like the, 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 the bridge between the worlds and the shaman stands like on, the, on that bridge connecting to all four of them and uh, as, assist their client or whoever they're working with to get that access. But when you do plant medicine, that doorway is open to you. And I think that's, where a lot of people enjoy going on San Pedro, Ayahuasca, or whatever it is, because it removes that that barrier. It's a very thin one at the moment, and it just removes that barrier. Mm. And what are the three worlds? You've got you've got the lower, which is uh, is is like a, many people see it uh, differently, but most people will say that it's an ancient world. It's a world that's uh, pre-human almost. Um, so when you go there, sometimes you'll see a desert, sometimes you'll see a forest, sometimes you'll just to see the sea. Everyone sees, but it's it's normally ancient land, um, and it's a land full of uh, beings that are mythical. We would call them mythical. So you'd see or see dragons, unicorns, bears will talk to you, wolves will talk to you. Uh, then you've got the the middle realm, which is a mirror of our realm, but it's a layer on top. And it's where you'll get to meet all of those spirits that have left their physical bodies but have not chosen or don't realise they're dead. And are in, so the middle realm's a bit... The, it's the more spooky one. It's the one where you'll see the ghosts and all the rest of it and demons, which is just people just pretending to be evil, but they're really not. Um, so that's the what more interesting one. Uh, and then the, the upper realm, it's, it's the angelic realm. It's the future realm. So if you go there, you might end up in a crystal city or you might end up on a spacecraft uh, yeah, or you might just go through a wormhole and end up in another galaxy. Um, so it's it's however your imagination works. So the, the way the spirits work with you when you're in those realms is they show you what your, your mind knows. So I went on a journey recently and I ended up on the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, of all things, and got beamed aboard by Scotty. You know, but it, it wasn't really them. It was just that the spirits are using that to communicate with me, and I needed some healing. So I ended up in the uh, the doctor's little, you know, the where they are on the Starship Enterprise, and she was standing there with this thing and zzz, doing some healings on me. Um, so the spirits will heal you, and they'll do it in a way that uh, makes sense to your mind. That's really interesting because I was having this conversation about, um, you know, when people encounter aliens or mm -hmm. like black smoke like demons, for example. Yeah. And a feeling that came up for me was that I'm not sure that they're actually there as such, or if it's a way that we project it that's relatable for us in a way that makes sense to us. Yeah. Exactly. That, that everything is, is just pure energy. So ev everything that's not physical um, is, is pure energy. And that pure energy works. It has to come down from the 9D all the way through to the our 3D layer. And when it gets here, it, it if it was presented to you as pure energy, it wouldn't make much sense to you. It would just, there's, there's no substance to it. So it says, okay, I'm going to give you some substance. It's gonna tap, I'm tapping into your mind. Okay, so you know the Starship Enterprise and you know Star Trek. Okay, so I'm going to use that and I'm going to create a, a a story in your head that's going to connect to you and that's how it's going to happen. So if, if you're seeing demons, it's because that's what you need to see at, the, at that time. So if you want to see fairies, then you'll probably see fairies. If you want to see dragons, you'll see dragons. If you want to see unicorns, you'll see unicorns. It's, it's because you've... You've set that intention, maybe not consciously, maybe more subconsciously than anything, and the subconscious is more powerful than the conscious, as you all know. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're seeing the energy in a form, like you say, to make sense to you so that it can communicate with you. All right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know in the comments below what was your favourite clip, and hopefully 
you've come across one of the episodes that you may not have listened to yet, in which case, go check it out and watch the full episode. All right, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you on the next one. Can't take it back, can't wish you gone, all that I